So I'm going to hand it back over to John now. Thank you all so much. All right. First of all, thank you very, very much to David. Uh, and thank you so much for the organizers of this event. And of course, thanks to all of you for coming out on this Saturday night. I really, really appreciate your support. This is only the second American screening of this documentary. So to see a live audience react to it, it really means a lot to me. And I really thank you from my heart for your support. Thank you. Um, as you know, when, from now we're going to be live streaming uh, this event. Uh, so the people who have just joined online, they were not able to watch the documentary. So to start, I'd like to give uh, a quick catch-up um, for people who are arriving late about what is PFAS, uh, what is the problem with PFAS on Okinawa. After that, I'd like to take you back in time to just after World War II. Just after World War II, Okinawa was nicknamed the junk heap of the Pacific. That's what the American military called Okinawa. Then finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about this inextricable relationship between colonialism and contamination, because this is a problem that's happened throughout the Pacific region, in Guam, in Saipan, in the Marshall Islands, and of course here in Hawaii. So just to start off, what are PFAS? So PFAS have earned the nickname Forever Chemicals, and PFAS are found in many different aspects of our lives. They're found in non-stick frying pans, in waterproof clothes, food wrapping, especially for hamburgers and pizza boxes. And also they are a key ingredient in military firefighting foam. PFAS basically last forever. And that's what's given them the nickname of forever chemicals. When a child is exposed to PFAS when they're really, really young, those chemicals will stay in their body until the child reaches retirement age. So these chemicals are really persistent, and these chemicals impact our human health in many, many different ways. This is a, a chart from the European Environmental Agency, and we have shown that PFAS, they can damage our hormones, our immune system, our cholesterol levels, and children are especially susceptible. So this is a problem that is becoming more and more widespread, and only recently are we, learning about the dangers of PFAS. But the makers of PFAS and the American military, they've been aware of these dangers for decades. The makers were aware of some of the dangers in the 1970s, about 50 years ago, and the military has known about the dangers since the 1980s. So they've known these chemicals were dangerous for more than 40 years. And so just like Agent Orange during the 1970s, this is a combination of makers and the military covering up the risks of these really, really terrible substances. In the United States, the DOD is currently checking uh, 700 bases for PFAS contamination. These bases are in every single state in the United States, and many local communities outside the bases have been impacted as well. As you know from yesterday's Pearl City talk, uh, these chemicals have impacted communities on Guam. But the big difference between the United States and where I live, Japan, is in the United States there is some measure of transparency. I know it's really, really small, but the military does have town halls and the military does release some limited information. The American military also reports about PFAS contamination in Germany and Belgium, Honduras and South Korea, but not in Japan. So in Japan, the American military is allowed to function at will. There's zero civilian oversight by the Japanese government and, of course, Okinawan authorities as well. They cannot go into the bases to check. At the heart of the problem are these bilateral agreements between Japan and the United States. According to these agreements, Japanese authorities cannot enter the base. When a US service member damages the environment, they can't be punished under Japanese law. And taxpayers of Japan, I, we, we pay for all the cleanup of base contamination. 
So the military can just contaminate the land and then give back the land and then it's up to the Japanese people to pay for that land to be remediated. So there's no motivation for the American military to clean up this contamination. All it needs to do is to give it back to the Japanese public and then we are the ones who have to pay to clean it up. This is the current situation on Okinawa, if you're just joining us at this time. Um, on the right side of the PowerPoint, these are some photographs that I got from the military from the Freedom of Information Act. And this is not snow. You know, this is firefighting foam. And this was a massive release of firefighting foam. And it happened in 2013. And as you see in the documentary, the drinking water for 450,000 residents has been poisoned. These chemicals are in almost half of the population of Okinawa's drinking water. Not only has the water been impacted, but also the sacred springs. They're really important for Okinawan indigenous religions. They've been severely contaminated beyond use. Farmers' fields for taro, uh, for taro the vegetable, um, they grow it in water fields, just like here on Hawaii. And in Okinawa, that soil is the most contaminated soil in Japan. And that is the runoff from Futama Air Base. And this is in Ginoan, in Ginoan, the city. The military refuses to allow information. The military never responds to my requests to meet them, to talk about this information. And there's never been a town hall event. The military has never allowed the public to confront them and ask them what's going on. When you saw the documentary, you saw Yoshiyasu-san, the retired school teacher, and he said that they were going to start to do blood checks on residents. Since we made the documentary, and that documentary was aired in June of last year, in the time since that documentary was aired, we have completed the blood checks on 387 residents, and people's blood is severely contaminated with PFAS. People's blood is contaminated at around about one and a half times to three times the national average. As you know, people on Okinawa used to be famous for living a long, long time. There was even a diet named the Okinawan diet. But in recent years, the life expectancy on Okinawa has been plummeting. It's been dropping really, really quickly. And please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's solely due to PFAS. It's a variety of factors. Of course, it might be poor diet, it might be driving and not walking. But the Japanese government needs to investigate. The Japanese government needs to find out just how much has PFAS lowered life expectancy on Okinawa and what can they do to help people who are suffering from diseases. Even worse, um, and what really broke my heart the most making that documentary, using FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, um, we got this map from the American Marine Corps, and according to that map, the fire training area is really polluted. But worse than that, the water from the fire training area is flowing towards a local elementary school. For me, this is criminal. Um, someone should be arrested for this crime against the children on Okinawa. After we made the documentary, the local uh, residents group, they went into the school and they checked the soil and they wanted to know how badly is it contaminated, and that soil is severely contaminated at levels many, many, many times over American government safety levels. So the school has had to cordon off those areas to stop children from going into them and stop children from getting exposed in this school. Schools are places that should be safe. Schools are places where kids should be able to enjoy running around in the dirt, but sadly, Okinawan kids don't have that luxury because they're getting contaminated by the military. Finally, the aquifer. And I know here in Hawaii, the aquifer is at the center of your attention and is the center of your worries. Okinawa has had to abandon its aquifer. Okinawa has had to give up using the aquifer as its water source. Because the aquifer is so badly contaminated, the water board of Okinawa they have had to use alternative sources for drinking water. They can't use the wells, they can't use the rivers that flow near the airbase. Now they have to use a dam, 
and they have to use desalination where they pull out the salt from seawater and convert it into water. So in Guam, um, in Guam as well, as you know, the aquifer under Anderson Air Base has been impacted with TCE uh, by the Air Force, and of course here in Hawaii. What I want to say to you is not, it's not too late for you. It's too late for people in Okinawa. Already the aquifer is decimated. But for you, it's not too late to stand up and to make sure that your aquifer is protected and to make sure that it's not contaminated like it has been in Okinawa. So I really ask you to raise your voices and demand that the military stops contaminating your aquifer before it's too late. Because we are what's happening. After World War II, uh, the American military nicknamed Okinawa the junk heap of the Pacific. Uh, these are photos from National Archives and it shows dumping chemical weapons in Okinawa Sea in 1964. During the 1945 to 1972 period, Okinawa was an American military colony. And I'm not using the word colony in the kind of a fake sense, it was literally a military colony. Um, there was a military governor who was in charge of the island and the governor controlled whether Okinawans could travel to Japan. And so if they were engaged in anti-American activities, they were not given passports to travel to mainland Japan. People couldn't vote for the governor. So it literally was an American military colony and they could do things that they couldn't do in other places in the world. So during the Cold War, Okinawa had the largest concentrations of weapons of mass destruction on the planet. There were 1,000 nuclear warheads, 13,000 tons of chemical weapons, and the military did experiments with biological weapons on rice fields in Okinawa. Not only were there accidents involving these nuclear chemical weapons, but also there was just this daily negligence of military operations. As you know, at Red Hill, the spills of the fuel were due to careless errors done by the military or by aging infrastructure. And it's exactly the same on Okinawa. For decades, the military has been making mistakes. They bring in new people every three years who don't have a sense of history of the installation. And sadly, Okinawa has been contaminated in many, many different ways. Using FOIA, uh, the newspaper I work for, Okinawa Times, we moved this English timeline um, of military accidents from 1947 to 2021. And there are dozens and dozens of these accidents. And if you, I should have said earlier, if you want a copy of this PowerPoint, uh, just send me an email and I can share it with you so you can read it in more detail. But these accidents are really disgusting. There are accidents with depleted uranium that they covered up. There are accidents with strontium-90, this radioactive element, in farmers' fields that the military covered up. And also there's extensive dioxin contamination throughout Okinawa. And the only way we could find out about these accidents is via the Freedom of Information Act. So I urge all of your public officials, I urge all of the media who are here tonight, please use FOIA. FOIA does work and you can get the documents that you're looking for. Before I wrap up this talk, please allow me just to finish a little bit to talk about colonialism and military contamination. I'm from Wales, uh, and Wales was England's first colony. You know, England destroyed my country's language, England destroyed our culture, and they made us ashamed to be Welsh. You know, there's a word in the English language to Welsh on a bet. That means to be dishonest and to be fake. That was a word created by the English to disparage my people, the Welsh race. So I know a little about colonialism, not as much as you guys or people in the Pacific region, but there is this connection between military contamination and colonialism and imperialism. So it's not only an American military problem, it's a military problem full stop in China. China tested nuclear weapons that uh, exposed Uyghurs uh, to radioactive contamination. Britain, my country, um, they tested mustard gas on Indians, and also they tested atomic bombs in Australia, contaminating indigenous Australians. And of course, post-World War II, the United States tested so many, so many nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands. And the same pattern played out again and again and again after World War II, whether it was Marshall Islands, Guam, Saipan, 
Tinian or Okinawa. There is this pattern of colonialism and contamination. Most of the islands in World War II, they were occupied by really brutal Japanese control. And when America liberated these islands, many of the inhabitants were initially quite fortunate and quite lucky. But then the military, they seized the best land on those islands, especially flat farmland to make airstrips. And then they started packing this farmland with bases. They started packing it with weapons of mass destruction. And this land was contaminated beyond repair. And even now in many communities, communities cannot go back to their land because it's just too contaminated. So when you see this problem of military contamination, please see it in its wider context. It's not only Okinawa, it's happening throughout this region, it's happening throughout this world. And if you voice up and if you stand up, I really think that we can overcome it and we can raise awareness about this issue. Thank you very, very much. For talking. If you have a, a, a phone, you can scan that QR code and it should pop up my contact information. Or if you just Google John Mitchell Japan, it should be somewhere in the top 100 hits. And, um, the thank you very, very much. Thank Um, yeah, thank you again so much, John, for that. Can we give John another round of applause? Um, um, so now I'm going to introduce... Oh, what was that? Oh, the... Okay, um, yeah, so now I will introduce the other panelists. Maybe if the other panelists can make their way to the, st um, to the stage right now as I'm... Um, um, but I guess while they're doing that, I wanted to just, um, I know Jal was already introduced, um, but I wanted just to highlight that his work has been not only recognized with awards, but featured in reports that, um, reports for the U.S. Congress and has been the focus of debate in Japanese Parliament. So John's work has, um, with FOIA and his investigative work has been, um, yeah, rustled a lot of military feathers, um, and... I highly recommend you all check out his book, Two Poisoning the Pacific. PFOS is just one thing that he discusses, and like the rainbow of herbicides, um, depleted, ura depleted uranium, nuclear radiation, etc. So yeah, hope you all can check it out. Um, okay, but now I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, so I'm going to introduce Erwin Kawata. So Erwin Kawata is Deputy Manager of the Board of Water Supply. He was formerly program administrator of the department's water quality division, where he oversaw drinking water testing and treatment. Um, and it was during this time that Erwin played a crucial role in the Board of Water Supply's response to the Navy's fuel leaks at Red Hill. And I know we've all seen him on the news, and we all deeply appreciate what he and the other folks at Board of Water Supply are doing to protect our water. So let's please welcome Erwin Kaltra. Um, next is Dani Spiritu. Dani Spiritu is a Kanaka Maoli from Ko'olau Koko, Oahu, and she's currently living in Waimalu in the Moku of Eva. She's a s member of the Oahu Water Protectors, and I just want to say another member of the Oahu Water Protectors. Dani does so much, and she's, oh, sorry, feed, feedback, does so much and, um, on the front lines, and we all deeply appreciate her. So let's applause for Dani. <laughs> Um, and last but not least is Chihiro Komine. She's currently an associate professor at Okinawa Christian University. She studied at UH Manoa and majored in American Studies. And she's a member of the Hawaii Okinawa Alliance and Ukwanshin Kabudan. And Chihiro does such amazing activist work both in Hawaii and in Okinawa. And we're so lucky to have her expertise and wisdom on this panel tonight. So please, let's applause for her. <laughs> Okay, so now we're just going to get um, a brief update from Erwin Kwata on the water crisis in Oahu and where things are at, especially with more recent spills of AFFF and as it relates to PFAS, but just more generally too. So uh, I'll pass it over to you. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. And, uh, you know, thank you for giving my, me the opportunity to be here. I'm sure everybody knows with respect to Red Hill, you know, the fuel is still in the tanks. The, the, uh, the military is talking about defueling the tanks, but obviously it's taking too long. 
Um, with respect to Interpolar, everyone knows that there was a trip uh, spill that happened uh, November of last year of Interpolar at uh, Casa Trade. Uh, the report, like everything else, you know, there's so many parallels in what's happening here as, as far as Okinawa in terms of availability of information. So that is still uh, pending. The report is still pending. Um, there is some test results that's uh, on the Navy's website, is Department of Health's website. I did take a look at it, but um, there is some uh, detections in, in the uh, soil and in the groundwater in their monitoring wells, but certainly um, we're asking them to continue to test and provide us that data. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, PFAS contamination, um, just like in, uh, I'm sure everyone has heard about uh, the uh, situation with the uh, um, OAR Army uh, National Guards facility in uh, in Wyalba and Pro City. Uh, they had uh, release over there. They had some detections in soil and groundwater uh, samples that was collected, and there's more study than so forthcoming. So I'm just going to stop there. So. Um, okay, um, so thank you so much, um, Erwin, for that update. Now I'd love to hear from Danny and Kito, so just have this question for you all. So you could just um, comment on maybe the similarities and differences in the respective water crises just from your position as an Okinawa and pitching out to, um, so yeah, wherever you want to take that. Yeah, Mahalo. Um, Mahalo for the question and um, Mahalo time for, for being here and, and for your work. Um, it was really emotional to go to the felt. I think from the beginning and see the Puna gathering water and then thinking about my old Puna in way what we used to get it from Puna, we can no longer do that. You know, our, our families to subsist in certain areas and, and I was just sharing with John earlier today. Throughout the pandemic, we've been going with my grandfather to those spots and like at, the, at those specific locations, there are now contamination sites that say that we're not able to, to even touch the water there. Uh, we're not able to to harvest fish there. Um, the the same streams that they would swim and gather in are now cemented and diverted, um, and so the time we that we wouldn't touch it. Um, and so within a couple of generations, even completely separate from Red Hill, but but very tied to the, the military occupation, uh, we see that in our community. Uh, and so a lot of the things that you know we we saw in the film are are things from from. Being in meetings where folks are, are seeing that there's no way to tie this contamination or what we're seeing here to the military um, and the runaround, you know, it, it was it was like a mirror image of what we saw last night um, at the Wayaba PFAS meeting where farmers are going and, and asking, you know, to get their, their INA tested or, or asking, you know, what if, if my water comes up positive, yeah, for, for, for traces of PFAS, will you test my family? And the direct answer was no. Uh, yeah, or, or in the interim, in the, in the, what is it, like months that we have to wait to get our water samples back, will you provide my, my family and my two-year-old son with, with water in the interim? And the answer was no, um, that it would be a finance, like a, a, a fiscal violation. Um, and so we, we, we see a lot of those consistencies. Um, and then for, even for us in, in Konawa, where we're worried about Kukati and Red Hill on that end and now Mayawa on the other end, um, and knowing that our aquifer is, uh, is connected, hearing what John had, had shared that they, what they have abandoned the use of their aquifer for drinking water. Like, I can't imagine what that is like. Or for that, that man who, whose father, you know, created that well in their yard to have to say, oh, oh we got to just fill it out. Um, these, these places that have sustained our own, and that, um, several years ago, I had the privilege of being in a, Indigenous politics class with my nice so one and no like, you call it Pua or Taitini. Um and we we're talking about Aloha Aina and one of the things that came up was, you know, if, if Ida is is Ohana, um and we, we have this deep Aloha for Aina, what does it look like if our stream is uncompeted or if you know our Ida is contaminated, do we does Aloha look like continuing to stay? Um and for us in our community and like in Apple, that's that's where we're at. You know, like, do we continue to stay? Do I continue to, to muddy the, the lo'ikalo that I was, that I was there today with, you know, these college students that, uh, knowing that in, in the Navy's own plan and should there be a catastrophic spill, 
we can have petroleum and now PFAS coming out of our springs that feed that, that what we call it. Like do we stay? Uh, or even like the, the, the mahi ai that were there at the meeting last night were, were just, you know, on the pu'uno and out that, that PFAS, PFAS still. Um, do we continue to stay and do we continue to, to welcome community being there? Uh, yeah, all, all, all of those things, like there's similarities. And then, and, you know, for us as indigenous people, it's like, you, where are we going to go? You cannot, you cannot be the Kula Ivi. The, the Ivi, the bones of our ancestors are there. You cannot be. And so what does it look like? What does a lot of look like in this sense? Um, and how do we navigate the emotions, even as the community was sharing, right? Of, of immense grief and mourning, coupled with like frustration and anger. Um, and how do we collectively, you know, feel and move forward and, and be able to advocate for the generations that we will never see in our lifetime. But that are depending on us. Like I was, I was, as we were talking about it, thinking that you know, for anybody in the room who's under twenty years old, like every water that you have ever drank fell outside of your lifetime. Yeah, the the, the rain that fell this morning isn't going to hit the the aquifer for another twenty years. Um, and so for the majority of us, you know, so much of what we consume was cared for by people that that we're not alive in our lifetime. And so what we do now, really, we're, we're advocating for generations. Hi. Hi. I really, um, share the same feeling that you actually uh, shared as from a Nakomoni perspective. And it's, it's such a, um, I think the, the apple, the, in the film that she, who said it towards the end, you know, they found out his well was contaminated and he saw an upbeat and he was told how the numbers were much, much higher than the, the national standard level. And then he said, you saw his face, right? He said, he could have chuckled a little bit and then in the end he said we have to we just have to feel it at that moment exactly this the cap capture that um of my um um sense of helpless helplessness and the guilty that's i think uh if you're coming from okinawa and uh, if you see the film of the punch that's the the, the the feelings that we especially women and and as a mother and, and the grandmother who has who we feel we're, it's our fault if we, if we don't know how to protect our child and how to how to, we don't protect we don't if we don't know how to protect our grandchildren. So, um, so um, that outward pain is the the same pain that Hawaiian people can feel and people in Hawaii who live here can feel uh, from the water situation. So, so one of the thing is that. Uh, yeah, I learned, uh, I was, I used to give you like students in Rigo and in the Hawaiian struggle what history and the Kumus um, and uh, community, uh, activism in the community that really shaped my sense of intellectual and then the political um, backgrounds. So I'm very really proud and privileged to say that um, my positionality and my knowledge and my status really heavily, hugely influenced by Hawaiian people. So I'm very, very um, honored to be here today. And then, um, so, one of the things I also learned that, uh, you know, if you know, you know, history, like Hawaii, um, we, um, it's not only about American imperialism and movements that happened after the war. Before America, we had, we had Japanese colonization. So, so we, uh, as you see the, the field on, um, it's, it's really the, we have to question the reversion. Um, what was the reversion was about in the 50 years ago, and we became um, Japanese cities under the Japanese um, um, government um, system that really made it more invisible and hidden about these military issues. We, because we cannot really, unlike you guys, we're not US citizens, so we cannot really go face to face with the military people or face to face talking to the American government. So we have to go through this Japanese defense people who doesn't tell us anything. And so that's one thing that uh, 
you know, the reversion, if you don't know much about it, that people just think, oh, that's a natural co course of history. Okay, now people wanted it. Okay, now people wanted to become but back to the Japanese, not uh, Japanese uh, control because years of occupation just job, just showed you a little bit, it was so bad. It was so violent, it's so colonial. So um, Jap Okinawa wanted to be back to the Japanese the constitution so that we, people like my alpha one met long generation of dangers, wanted to have an equal basic civil rights under the Japanese um, system. But so this, after 50 years later, we just now are uh, learning and experiencing and that uh, the things hasn't really changed much. And so that's one thing. So, um, and the other thing was really uh, speaking of a okay, uh, feeling um, the same way. But, um, how, how do we um, deal with this sense of guilt and helplessness and how can we overcome this pain? You know, yes, John san just said, okay, now people have to abundance and give up for the well. That really breaks my heart, you know. And then it's, it's you know, how I deal with maybe not too late for you guys to stand up. But for us, it's over. Is this it, right? So, um, so that's kind of like sense of, um, we call it, we have a uchina, uchina, uchi term, chirudai, and um, chirudai means, because we got, sorry, I'm sorry, excuse my word, but we got really fucked over many, many times, so that we feel this sense of like helplessness again and again today, because so many forces of Japanese and American colonialism that's really everyday life, every day, like constantly the forces of American and Japanese colonialism um, has a real consequences of like land recommendation and more major recruitment. Uh, our ancestral bones was um, just, uh, stolen and stored in, in the university in Japan and they don't want to give us back that. And, um, and noise pollution. And, um, I work at the university where like every day that this military helicopters and airplanes make so much noise that we get even, we have to just not just pretend that we don't hear it, but that's the, the reality that we have to live. And on top of that, there's PFAS game, and including me and majority of Okinawa okay, people probably feels like we, we got to look up, look with this uncle in the field too, like, oh, again, right? We just, we have to feel it. We have to, um, but, it, but at the same time, it's, it's a tremendous sense of guilt that not knowing that you see the film in the ladies and at my age, that you know that the generation cast away children say that is it our fault at not knowing? That's why this is what happening, and so um, so so, so uh, access to information th thanks to the work that John Bichel San does, that's very empowering, and that's that's the thing that we definitely need to know that how we access to the, this legal and historical information that really makes this situation happen. And number two is mostly important for me as indigenous Jew women, that how I can, how we can reimagine this. If you said that, how does Aloha look like, right? And then, so we, because we're so disconnected with, from the Okinawa's um, history and culture in the landscape, there was, uh, you know, that one of the rivers that they mentioned in the film. Um, most of us younger generation, I mean, I'm not now getting over there. <laughs> 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 my generation, they can be younger, maybe my students can speak. But like, Hijanawa, Hijan River, it's just a, it's a, we don't have much rivers in Okinawa. And it's just, it's, we don't have any images that, that the rivers has life. It's, to me, it's, it's a dead water, dirty, and um, it's just there, and it kind of looks scary. And we have some, um, People just hang out sometimes, go. but you know, it's just not that no meaningful um, attachment to Hijagao. But this um, PFAS, this is unfortunate. And we, I, we have this sense of animal, right? That you saw the lady was expressing from frustration. We, we call this expression, she was to do. She was to do meaning. She will mean like in this, I don't know how to explain this part of your body in a, in a in a deep down in the stomach, and it's from this from the part it, that's anger so arising from it, and we don't know what to do it. So that's the feeling of to to do that we all share. But um, oh, I'm too angry for that. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, but, so, but, but after that, like, we get so tired and so helpless when we have to angry every single day. And then so, um, so how we can overcome this pain and uh, senselessness and helplessness. And so this, it's, it's so such a place that we, uh, other, with the other delegation from Okinawa in Japan, uh, were um, dealing with this issue of um, uh, ancestral book repatriation from Japanese university. And uh, I was so privileged to work with this uh, uh, poem uh, after this and, and, and coconuts and, and a local uh, family Hawaiian people who actually work, works for, uh, for the repatriation work for a long time. And one of the things we learned as a Jinanju from Ben was uh, uh, not only access to the information from um, government and legal whatsoever, but also how to access to our indigenous cultural uh, knowledge, you know, uh, how to activate ancestral memories. So that's one of the very important things for us to, to do, to just to feel like a human, to feel treated as uh, the same people uh, by the Japanese government and American government. So. Um, that gave us this issue it was really painful. It makes us so angry, but at, at the same time, it's a wake up call for Uchidamshu to actually to realize that, oh, there is a river actually has a name. And, and there's other places that we didn't know because so hidden in the, uh, uh, the uh, right now that we don't know there's uh, so many sacred places around it. And there is a small pond actually has a name we didn't know. It really gave me a chance to and, and, and forced me to look up look up the history and what this place actually was called from my um, from the old time that everybody don't know anymore. So that's a reconnection to the land and the water. It's really this painful wake up call that uh, we probably needed to to do. Uh, I don't know if like we need it. We don't want to say that we need it, but that's what makes us to do. So this activate ancestral uh, memories might be the the source of power and encouragement and empowerment for uh, move us forward to fight. And as a woman, not like Ampo, like he just like he just chop one and he just said we gave up, right? We just feel the well. But as one man, as a mother, we really have to keep fighting, right? To protect a child, protect children and the grandchildren or whatever. So uh, so uh, for that, so for access to him, sorry to this giving going too long, but activating access to memories, me um, and, and stuff. I work with us, how Okinawa is, and Okwachi Kabudang, and we all, all talk about the cultural knowledge and cultural identity with people. And we went through, um, so said, I wanted to know if there is any cultural um, meaning to uh, one of the rivers that mentioned it was people's issue, Hijagawa. And Hijan River, um, I've heard about um, a name on the uh, the song of the stuff is so a no man actually helped um, to look for this one song and um, he just I don't, I don't know if anybody was on FA edition what he was singing during the break but this is so and so so maybe it's if we have time he can speak that word free so that he can explain the term the use of it and so uh, so this this song called Hijagawa Kokta so probably uh, this must be composed and, and created like after the uh, maybe before the war, after the war. This is a composer that Ken Shigeo was born in the 1920s and 30s. So he actually created this song about this river, which we have no idea how it looked like before the war. Um, so they don't shot. Can we go back to that? You have a second. That really, really, that was my healing moment to understand the lyrics.
I'll, I'll just talk wrong. So, uh, of course, the Hizagawa no Mijiya is the waters of, of the Hiza, Hiza River, Hizagawa. And Umanchu no, uh, Umanchu Inuchi, it's tied to the life, the, the lives and the life of everyone. Michi no Kuchinaji means is that this water connects us like a thread. It draws connections to us. It ties us all together and binds us together. And this is perpetually, day and night, this is our connection, this is our connection to light, this is our connection to, uh, our connection to life and liberty, but also to each other in this way. Thank you everybody, and thank you for Hawaii people, Hawaii uh, struggle um, that you went through and sustained the struggle that teach us a lot. I think now we're going to just open it up to the audience questions. So if anyone has a question, they get this. Ask it. They guess. Turns. Yeah, oh, there's a couple. Um, I guess, yeah, in the back. Thanks, everybody, for organizing this. And thank you for coming. I have a question about direct action. Excuse me, the Okinawa situation. It looked like you were doing a lot of, um, you know, going through the records and really doing a lot of fact finding and checking. That's also very good. But were there any like big strikes or moments where you know people got together and in large groups and, and they'd be like, I don't know, they could do the Air Force with the base or something like that, something you know, kind of large and expressive. <laughs> Maybe John um, can follow up a little more because um, because I have been really being in the uh, the, uh, the active um, the drug action movement myself. So I'm kind of hesitant to speak for themselves today. But as far as I see, I mean, I talk to my um, students that younger people don't know uh, even don't know anything about people's issues. So that's the general understanding. So I know uh, there's a, a small group of um, women's and also the community people as for, uh, forming this group to do the sign baby and stuff but still it's just really small and they have uh, one they was showing the film the one um Kelly Dai Dai means uh bass gallery but that's kind of like a one shot big gallery so if you miss it uh, you don't see it anymore so I think that I think COVID uh, really uh, influenced about the mass movement just maybe John can uh, update the situation So I think every week there's a standing protest uh, in Ginon, uh, where members of the Okinawan community stand up with signs. Um, also, many community members stand outside the bases uh, with English signs saying that please don't poison our water with PFAS. But I, I'd just like to appeal to you, um, to the Americans in the audience, for decades the American government has ignored the voices of Okinawans. No matter how hard Okinawans have protested, the American military, the American government has ignored them. So I urge you to contact your senators, contact your Congress members, contact your government and ask them to challenge SOFO, the status of forces agreement. This is what keeps Okinawans poisoned. This is what prevents the communities from entering their own bases, their own land, and checking for contamination. The military and the government can ignore Okinawans. They know so, because the Japanese government doesn't care. But if you, as Americans, contact your elected officials and demand investigations, if you demand that they rewrite the status of forces agreement, then that will engender change. And I've never given a presentation in America before, and I don't know how you will respond to this, uh, but I really urge you to please contact the people with power and demand they take action on this issue. And the other questions? The grassroots community forest house. 
We need to enunciate so we can hear back here. Wait, oh yeah, and then actually, uh, when he asked the question, if the panelists can repeat the question. So I think the question is, uh, what does the military do for its drinking water? Um, is it drinking the contaminated water? The answer is, it's the same water. So the military is poisoning its own service members, and the military isn't providing information to its service members, and is covering it up. Because the military knows if the service members complain, and if they raise up this problem, then the military will maybe be forced to act. So it's the same water from the municipal water source that goes on the base. Um, so they're poisoning their own people, just like Red Hill. And so, you know, the military doesn't care about its own troops, they dispose of them. Sorry, let's go. People are in water. What are the resources? I said, a long time. What are the resources? What are they using for clean water now? So now Okinawa Prefecture is using desalination and also they draw the water to the dams. Um, so they've stopped using well water, river water, because it's too contaminated. So they've been forced to seek out different sources of water. And this year, this is 2023, it's going to be the first year of that they're using these new resources. So if there's a drought, and you know there's so much tourism on Okinawa, just like Hawaii. And tourism just eats up water. Golf courses, swimming pools, tourists taking six showers a day because they don't smell bad. And so it's the same thing that wherever tourist industry is. It's kind of the same as Hawaii. You know, it's the military, it's tourism that's stealing all the water from the local population. Um, so I was wondering about, I don't know, I think it's a Feel like there's a lot of corruption in government contracting and so i was thinking about the you know for 40 plus years some chemical company got the contract to provide all this you know toxic fells and is it there some other alternative than this toxic fell or or even just like yeah alternatives to roundup alternatives to anything that's toxic but like has it in, they come up with anything else that they could use instead and and why do they just keep perpetuating, like, you know, using toxic chemicals? This comes to be the question. So why is military of the companies continuing to use these toxic foods? Yeah, why are they continuing to give whatever chemical, like, I don't know who the chemical company is, but, you know, you follow the money, there's somebody making a lot of money off of all these toxic chemicals. And, I mean, you know, kind of like it just stop them. them. Yeah. For, for a long time, civilian airports, have stopped using those foams. They've been using foams that don't contain PFAS. But the American military, they made it mandated, foams must contain PFAS, because they thought it was the best way to smother a fire in a really quick uh, time period. But this year, just recently, I think within one or two months, maybe the beginning of the year, the American government announced from now, the military can use those PFAS-free foams. So there's so much trouble. You saw 700 bases being contaminated in America. And so the government is understanding the liability. They can have to pay for service members in the future who are dying. They have to pay to clean up the water. So finally, the American government has decided to act. And it says the military can use uh, PFAS free phones. So it will improve, but because these chemicals last for decades in the water, then it just keeps being contaminated. And it's in your body all your life. And so even if it was stopped using today, it would still be with us until we die. Oh, is that key? Yeah, well that's that. Sorry, I think I have time for one more question. Sorry, I have nine minutes left. Yeah, so as we've seen in the film, Japan has the ability to test the water so and run for PFAS. Do we have resources here if we're ready to test for that? 
Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. That one will work. This will work. Uh, with respect to uh, the question was, uh, uh, do we have the ability here in Hawaii to test for PFAS in soil, water, and blood? Uh, for I can speak on the, the water. Yes, we do have the ability to test for PFAS in water. Uh, there are test centers that can do it in the soil as well. I'm not so sure about the blood. Is, yeah, and for that, I'm wondering, is there any way we can like, and reach out to for a university or any or any country that can give us the ability to test that here at a speed it looks like we're going to these apps right so the question was uh, it can can you know the public reach out to the university or other agencies to request for their ability to test they get blood um the answer is uh you know, I'm not so sure about that as far as the blood is concerned. For me, I would think the, the first place would be to kind of make talk talk to your uh, your own uh, primary care your physician, and ask them, and they can consult with uh, the medical labs as to their ability to test for PFAS and blood. Um, with respect to water is concerned, uh, border water supply. I've been doing it since 2020, uh, when the new methods have been coming out, and I've been testing all of our wells that serve. Our system uh, in 2020, 21, and 22. Um, this year, we are mandated by um, federal regulations to make PFAS testing. So that has that work has begun. Uh, throughout the entire period, we only found four of our well stations that had extremely low levels, right at the minimum detection limit. Uh, we issued public notices on those. Uh, two of those sources had to get taken offline because of equipment problems. Um, but the rest of them remain in service. Uh, so uh, the testing, like I said, continues. And so far, we're not detecting any PFAS in, uh, in our wells, except for the ones that we've already you know, detected them. about direct action. Actually, um, today, which would have been yesterday in Okinawa, they had a, a rally in Inoa. Um, those are here early, may have saw a photo, a group photo. That was actually a solidarity group photo for us. I heard this song like 20 years ago and I fell in love with it, but I didn't realize the significance of, of it until now. But the, um, the river that you folks saw in that film, Hijagawa, is a uh, culturally very important uh, river to us. There's a lot of stories attached to it. Um, but this particular song is called Hijagawa Kouta. Oh, 